It is not easy to get a raw 30 in specialist mathematics. There is a reason why it scales up to 42 or 43. But by practicing and mastering skills like the five key skills we'll look at in this video, you can give yourself every chance. Implicit differentiation. So this is something that has come on exam one basically every year for the last 10 or 20 years. Doesn't necessarily mean it will be on your exam, but it's a pretty good chance. So you definitely want to make sure you can do these questions. This one is a little bit different in that we are asked for the second derivative. So we're going to have to do the implicit differentiation twice. Um, but let's see how that works. So to start off with, with implicit diff, we want to take the derivative of both sides with respect to x. It's just that because we've got y um, here on the left hand side, y itself is a function of x. So to, uh, to differentiate 2xy, we need to use the product rule. So for example here, if we let u be 2x and v be y, then um, using a product rule, our derivative will be 2 times y plus 2x times the derivative of y. Then for this term here, the y squared, we're going to use a chain rule times the 2 down, so 2 times y, but then we need to multiply by the dy dx. Um, once we get to there, I would then sub in x is 1 and y is 1 as early as possible. So once we've done the implicit diff, we can sub in those conditions. In this case, we don't have to solve for y. We're given um, when x is 1, y is 1. In some cases, we're just given an x value, then we have to use the original equation to solve for y. But here we can substrate in and then solve for dy dx to figure out dy dx is negative 2. But we're not done. This was a five mark question. We have to work out the second derivative. So we need to take our first derivative and then differentiate it again implicitly. Um, so just to make it a little bit easier, just firstly divide everything by two and then take the dy dx out here as a common factor so that then we can with this term do a product rule. So the derivative of this would be three plus dy dx plus, and here's our product rule, second derivative times x plus y plus dy dx times the derivative of x plus y. Okay, once we have that, then we can sub in x is 1, y is 1, dy dx is negative 2, as we found from before, and then rearrange to solve for d squared y dx squared as negative 3 on 2. Okay, so quite a bit of work there, but five marks out of exam one is quite a lot of marks. Now, this was an exam one question, but just to bring in the CAS calculator, um, we can do this under menu calculus implicit differentiation. So we just type in the whole equation, comma x, comma y. This will give us dy dx. If we want to sub in specific values like x is 1, y equals 1, we can do that with the vertical line here after the implicit diff, and we get dy dx is negative 2. Now, we can actually do a second derivative on the CAS, and the way that works is uh, after the comma x comma y, comma 2 tells it we want the second derivative. And again, like we can sub in our conditions, x is 1, y is 1, and this would actually evaluate for us the second derivative at that point which is, as we found, negative 3 on 2. So that's quite handy for exam 2 there. Um, but yeah, implicit diff, very likely to be on your exam 1, so something to make sure that you can do if it is there. Next one is solving complex polynomials. So we'll look at two main types that often come up. The first is this type where we have like z to the 4 equals some complex number, or like find the fourth roots of some complex number. This is the case where we get the four roots equally spaced around the circle. And that will be the same whether it's cube roots, um, we get three roots, six roots, whatever. So we use polar form for these ones. And so the first step will be to rewrite our complex number in polar form. In order to do that, draw a little diagram. Real part is negative eight root two. Imaginary part is eight root two. So this is gonna be in quadrant two. If we take out a common factor of eight root two, um, then we get negative one plus i here. We can work out that negative one plus i has a length of root two and an angle of three pi over four. Okay, it is in quadrant two. If we just use an inverse tan, a common mistake is to get negative pi and four and put this complex number in the fourth quadrant but it is not in the fourth quadrant. It is in the second quadrant. So the angle should be three pi over four. That's why I recommend you always draw a diagram just so you don't mix up the quadrants. Um, okay, so this complex number z to the four is 16 cis three pi and four. Then we go ahead and apply our Demoise theorem where we take the modulus to the power of one over four. For the angle, we just divide by four. This is gonna give us our first solution. It will be two cis three pi and 16. 
But then as we said, we're gonna get four solutions equally spaced around the circle. So I think again, like just drop a little diagram and then we can work out that each of these solutions are gonna be pi over two apart from each other. So we can add or subtract pi over two. In this case, our denominator is 16. So we're adding or subtracting eight pi over 16. And the question did say we want principal arguments. So just be a little bit careful not to go above pi uh, or below negative pi. So for Z2 there, we take three pi and 16, add eight pi and 16, will be 11 pi and 16. For Z3, I'm gonna go backwards, okay? Because if I go forwards, I'm gonna be too big. My angle will be beyond pi. So I'm gonna start from Z1 and subtract one full pi or negative 16 pi over 16. They'll give me negative 13 pi over 16. For Z4, take three pi and 16, take away eight pi and 16, I get negative five pi and 16. Again, I think the diagram really helps there. Just draw out your four solutions equally spaced around the circle. And then we can check that they're, uh, they are actually pi over two apart. So that's the Demoise theorem type question. Um, the other type question is the conjugate root theorem where we have a polynomial with real coefficients. So in this case, we'll get the solutions occurring in conjugate pairs and very standard first question, given one solution, you know, find one more solution, or in this case, write down a quadratic factor. Well, if Z equals I is a solution, that means Z minus I is a factor careful of the wording there and the difference between a solution and a factor. And then by the conjugate root theorem, um, Z plus I is also a factor. Multiplying those out, we get Z squared plus one as our quadratic factor. For part B, essentially it's asking to find all the solutions. So find the other solutions. We're told the second quadratic factor is Z squared plus BZ plus C. So rather than doing a long division or something, I think just set it up in the two brackets and then we can pretty easily work out that C has to be six. Okay, we're looking at one times C must give this constant here of six, C has to be six. And in a similar way, we can actually work out that B has to be negative four, because if we look at the cubic term here, minus four Z cubed, where's that gonna come from? It can only come from BZ times Z squared. There's no Z in the first bracket, so we'll get no cubic term from this Z squared here. So therefore B must be negative four, our quadratic becomes z squared minus 4z plus 6. You can do that using quadratic formula. Um, I've done it using completing the square and solve, we get two solutions. Um, so combining that with the two we had from part A, we get our four solutions, which do occur in conjugate pairs because this quadratic polynomial had real coefficients. So there's an example of the conjugate root theorem uh, type polynomial. So you definitely want to master those two types of complex polynomials. One, the Dimois theorem type with roots equally spaced around a circle, and two, the one with real coefficients where the roots occur in conjugate pairs. So the next key skill for you is sketching rational functions. This one, um, although it may not have appeared so much in past exams, with the new study design, really if you look at the uh, functions and graphs areas of study, it really only mentions rational functions. Graphs of rational functions, simple quotient functions, okay, we're not having anything about those like inverse trig functions or ellipses, a hyperbola that used to be in the old study design. Those are now pushed back into units one and two. So if there is a graph sketch on your exam one, it's pretty likely that it will be one like this, a rational function. So this is from VCAR 2008 exam one. Uh, the equation is two over x squared minus x over two. So the first thing we want to do with something like this is identify the asymptotes and sketch them in. And when x is zero, you're going to have an asymptote because this term will be undefined. So vertical asymptote on the y-axis when x is equal to zero. And the next thing is as x approaches infinity, this term approaches zero and we just left with this term negative x over two. So that's gonna be our non-vertical asymptote, straight line asymptote at y equals negative x over two. So definitely sketch those in. If you don't have anything else, you probably get a mark. And it sets you up for being able to sketch the rest of the graph if you've got the asymptotes in place, like the backbone, I guess, of your graph. Um, next thing, there's not gonna be a y-intercept in this case because x is zero is an asymptote, but there will be an x-intercept if we set y is equal to zero. Uh, we can solve and find the x-intercept is at the cube root of four and this uh, roughly somewhere between one and two will get an x-intercept and we can work out then that the graph has got to approach the asymptotes approaching the asymptote at x equals zero and the other one at negative x over two next thing probably the most work would be the turning point and in order to do that we'll have to use calculus okay. so take the first derivative 
Um, and then solving for when the derivative is equal to zero, that would give us the turning point. Uh, we find it's when x is at negative two, and subbing in we'll get y is equal to three over two. So one single turning point, which makes sense when we look at the asymptotes, it's got to approach this asymptote, turn around somewhere, and then approach the vertical asymptote. Be careful with the shape around your asymptote. So the assessors have mentioned they're very picky about this. We're not curving away, we're not crossing, just being really careful to approach the straight line asymptotes there. Um, and then you should be good. So this was like a five mark question. If you can do something like that on your exam one. So there we are, rational functions. Make sure you practice those for your exam one. Next is proof by induction. So this was new to the study design in 2023. It did appear on the 2023 exam one, as well as the Northern Hemisphere 2024 exam, and also did appear heavily on those VCAR sample questions for 2023. So highly likely this is gonna come up on your exam one or your exam two. Um, we don't have a lot of past exam questions on this. So this is actually a Cambridge A-level exam question. It's a divisibility type. So we need to prove that this expression is divisible by eight, for every positive integer n. As always with proof by induction, easy to get started, we just do the base case. In this case, the base case is when n is equal to one. So we sub in one and we get 24. That is a multiple of three as required, so we're good. Pretty much the base case is gonna get you one mark. So make sure you do it carefully, do it correctly, and you're good for one mark. Next with proof by induction, we're gonna set up our assumption. So we're gonna assume that for n is equal to some value, say k, this thing is going to be a multiple of eight. So we can say it's eight times p, where p is an integer. And what we need to prove then is that for the next value of n, say k plus one, it's also going to be a multiple of eight. We'll probably avoid using the same letter here because if this one is eight p, this one is not necessarily gonna be eight p, it's gonna be eight times something else. Okay, so how are we gonna make this proof? We always need to use the assumption. So we're looking at this expression here for p of k plus one, and we're thinking, how can we use the assumption? How can we use the fact that this is a multiple of eight? In this case, our first logical step, I think, is to break up the five to the k plus one into five times five to the k. And then this term in here, which is four k plus five, um, up here we have 4k plus 1, so it sort of makes sense we're going to break that up into 4k plus 1 plus 4. Then in order to use our assumption, we want to break off this term. So we want a 5 to the power of k times 4k plus 1. So now what we can do is look at this term here by expanding out this bracket. We'll get a 4k plus 1 times 5 to the power of k. That is what we had up here from our assumption. Um, by expanding out the bracket here, we'll get 5 times 4 is 20 times 5 to the power of k. So we can swap this underlined term here for 8p plus one. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. Um, we've used our assumptions and probably into like three or four marks already here. Um, and now what we need to do is prove that this whole thing is a multiple of eight. Well, what can we do? Probably expand the brackets. Five minus one is four, and we get four times one plus five times five to the power of k. Now 40p is obviously a multiple of eight, but why is four times that second bracket also a multiple of eight? Well, if we look at that second bracket, we can work out uh, definitely it has to be even because five times five to the k is gonna be odd. We add one, that's gonna be even. Four times an even number is gonna be a multiple of eight. So I've called it um, eight r up here. Therefore, this whole thing is a multiple of eight as required. So that proof by induction is not that easy. You know, there's quite a few algebraic steps there. But just taking a few steps back, you know, the setup is always the same. Base case, you're gonna get one mark. Um, write your assumption clearly, and then what you need to prove. Already, you're probably getting two marks out of four or five, okay? And then the rest of it, obviously, you have to make the proof somehow by using your assumption. I've got some more examples on proof by induction in the video I did last year, so you can feel free to check that out too. And key school number five is integration by parts. Again, new in 2023. And again, the exam writers have shown that they really like putting these on exam one. So I wonder if you have a look at these three integrals, think uh, which one of them do you think would be suitable for using integration by parts? This one actually is easiest to do with the linear substitution, u is one minus three x. Uh, the third one, again, do with the u substitution, u is tan two x and the integral, uh, the derivative uh, due dx is sec squared or two sec squared two x is sort of there in our integral. 
Um, so the second one is a good candidate for integration by parts. So that's the example we'll look at. All right, so as a first step, we wanna choose u and div dx. And in this case, we wanna choose u as this function, this bracket squared, because when we differentiate it, it's gonna become simpler. It's going to become linear. Whereas the sine, the sine function, once we integrate that, it doesn't really become any more complex. So we choose u to be the one that after we differentiate it, it's gonna become simpler. Then we apply our integration by parts formula uh, as it is on your formula sheet. So I've just called the integral i here just to avoid rewriting the whole thing again. And using our integration by parts formula, we get u times v minus the integral of du dx times v. Now we can sub into this term straight away, so evaluate the definite integral, but for the right integral, we're gonna to have to actually do integration by parts again. So we'll let u again be this term, the linear term. Now, once we differentiate it, it's going to be a constant. I've just, we can sort of ignore the negative two. I can pull that outside the integral. So let u equal x plus pi on six. And again, dv dx be the trig function, because when I integrate that, it doesn't get any more complex, it just becomes a sine function. All right, so then we apply integration by parts formula a second time and uh, probably need to move my head a little bit so I'm in the way, <laughs> how's that? Um, so here we are, so we're subbing into that first term, subbing in pi on three and zero. And then for that, everything in this big bracket, that is the integration by parts formula applied again on this second integral. And we're pretty much there now, you just have to sub into that second term there, this one is easy to anti diff, it's just gonna become a cosine. And then it's just a matter of doing all the arithmetic correctly. I say just is probably actually the hardest part is doing this all without making any errors. Um, but if you follow that through, you can try it yourself if you like, should turn out to be this expression here. Now, so that example, we had to apply integration by parts twice. Um, you know, you can use the table method. Some people prefer that. I would just say, be careful. If you do it and it's correct, you're likely going to get full marks. But if you make a mistake, it may be harder to get your method marks if you're not writing out clearly what is u du dx. But in general, I probably recommend just to go with the formula that is on your formula sheet, writing out u dv dx, etc. You can always check with the table if you prefer that. And if you haven't already, you might like to check out this video uh, on all the different integration techniques you need for specialist maths. Now it's your turn to practice.